Hello everyone, you're watching Be a Leader, our limited series featuring CEOs, trailblazers, and world leaders. I'm Neza Adawi, founder and CEO of Jain Meshad, the New York-based company that empowers women on a daily basis and engages with them on societal change. Our guest today is Roy Gonzarski, CEO of Magnix, an electric aviation propulsion company with a vision of connecting communities with low-cost clean air transportation among Roy's past accomplishments include serving as chief customer officer at the Boeing company. Hello, Roy. Hi, how are you? Great. Roy, can you tell us how you've been keeping up with the, the challenging times and, and where does your company stand today? Well, it's definitely been a fascinating period these last four months uh, between our growth as a company Uh, due to what we're doing in electric aviation, uh, flying electric aircraft, developing the electric propulsion systems, and then on the complete other side of the things, everything that's going on with COVID-19, uh, we've unfortunately had to lay off some people. Uh, so it's been an interesting uh, period of time, but so far everyone's coping well and we're making progress. Great, I love the positive spirit. So Magni X um, is a company that is a leader in the industry of aerospace and, and the defense industry. Can you, tell it, can, can you tell me what makes it disruptive in that space? Well, there's a few things we're doing. Uh, first of all, the technology that we have is pretty advanced. We've been able to develop electric propulsion systems that are powerful enough, yet lightweight enough, and turning at very low speed. So from a technological perspective, really well suited to aircraft. Uh, there's only two companies in the world that have so far been able to develop motors of this scale, and we're one of them, which is fantastic. Uh, the other thing is our uh, get things done attitude, if you will, uh, as opposed to doing a lot of research and analysis in the background and trying to find the perfect solution on paper and then trying to actually make it happen. Our goal is let's make it real. And so we very quickly took our propulsion system into the air on two different aircraft and have been flying them for quite some time to learn a lot of good lessons. Now, of course, all the safety analysis, et cetera, has been done, but taking action is really what helps us uh, put into a leader, uh, leading position. I totally relate to that as an entrepreneur myself. You have been a successful chief customer officer at Boeing, then became the CEO of a startup that you led from being a seed software startup to a profitable multi-million dollar SaaS company. How do you become a good CEO? And how do you become a CEO from, from that past job as, as a chief customer officer to the CEO of a startup? Well, wow, that's a really good question. I, I wish I could tell you. I know I get to speak to students a lot here in the area uh, and, and try to mentor them. And they all have a very similar question. What was your plan? What was your roadmap to becoming a CEO? And I tell them, I wish I, I had a roadmap. Uh, I think there's a few things that helped me become a CEO. Uh, one is uh, being lucky. Uh, I think we're all lucky at various stages in our lives. Uh, and I too was lucky. But the second part is identifying when that luck is looking at you in the face and saying, hey, here I am, I'm lucky for you. And the third is after identifying it, actually doing something about it. So being lucky, identifying that luck, and then grabbing that luck by the shoulders and saying, hey, you're mine, I want to actually do something, that's really what allowed me and enabled me to get to where I am, from starting as a, a low-level person at the Boeing company and finding opportunities to make things better, to improve, and then having that luck for some management person to say, hey, why don't you come take this job? And then taking it, taking that risk and going to the unknown position that I didn't know if I could succeed at or not. But being confident that, you know, if I say I can do it, why not? Let's try it. And just keep doing that, being flexible. And that led me to where I am. So taking the challenge and then training yourself to succeed it. Yeah. And, and, okay. believing, and believing that even when I fail, and I've had multiple failures, even when I fail, make mistakes, do things wrong, how do I learn from them and get moving forward? It is, you know, it's it's a conversation that we have with the women executives, and and it is a lack of of confidence that a lot of women um, had in the past 20 years, where they were very well trained to take on missions, but they would feel that 
they, they don't have that that confidence to succeed it. So um, within within your company, how is it? I, I guess it's more like of a masculine industry, is it? It's very aerospace is very much a masculine industry, unfortunately. Uh, in our company right now, we have I think a little over twenty percent women. Uh, we proactively look to hire more women, especially in the engineering roles. You know, the other roles like HR and so on, uh, it's a lot easier. But in the engineering roles, it's a lot harder. I see it for my own eldest daughter who's studying mechanical engineering, uh, and there are not a lot of girls who do it. And which, which means there's even less girls or women who then do it in aerospace, which means there's less applicants. So it's very hard to do, uh, but not for lack of trying. Is there anything that Magni X could do or, or does in terms of initiatives, maybe in universities or so on, to uh, to empower that, to, to have more uh, women and girls study engineering? Apart, yeah, from, um, apart from putting your own daughter in inspiring. <laughs> That's right. So, so first, right. Yeah, first we start with our kids. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. So there's a few things that we do. One, first of all, for our existing women employees, and for those that we recruit, uh, we have very uh, uh, relatively amazing uh, benefits uh, that are specific for uh, not just women, but young parents. Uh, maternal leave uh, that is over four months long, fully paid, full salary and benefits, uh, even as a startup of 50 employees, to offer that is pretty amazing. Uh, then we offer also paternal uh, leave, a little shorter, but still very significant uh, compared to what other even larger companies provide. Uh, we have a nursing room in our office uh, with a small refrigerator and so on. I remember my own wife having to go uh, 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 breast pump in a car in a parking lot and thinking that's just not okay. So at MagniX, we have a, a room where young uh, mothers can go and do that in privacy and not worry about being seen in the parking lot, which is just wrong. Uh, then of course we have proactive uh, activities trying to recruit women. Uh, we purposely look for uh, women resume, women's resumes. Uh, we'll go to universities uh, and talk to groups of girls, students, saying, hey, this is actually okay for you to come work at. It's actually very exciting, et cetera. Uh, and even down to middle school level, we just finished a project with the Junior Achievement uh, Group in, in Washington State that help middle school and high schoolers try to look at what future career opportunities are there. So we participated in that, and many of the women in our company participated in that in order to try and be role models and encourage even middle school girls to look at this career as a potential career. Great. So leadership, right, is a word that we hear a lot. Can you tell me what it means to you? You know what? I can't relate to that word. Don't, don't you feel that we've been hearing a lot about leadership, leadership, and so how how you know how do you relate to it how how, how are, have you been a leader so you know I, I remember as a young officer in the military asking one of my commanding officers how do you know when you've achieved leadership and he said oh that's very easy when you're running to your target look back if your people are following you you're a leader and if you're not you'll find out very quickly and so to me, uh, that really is leadership. It's not about the position you have. It's not about the title you have. It's about do people choose to and want to follow you? I won't even say blindly, but without asking questions because they trust that where you're taking them, the journey you're taking them on and the destination is right. Now, they should ask questions. Uh, in fact, at MagniX, we encourage not only questions, we encourage debate an argument, not, hey, let's quietly say, you know, I disagree. No, if you think I'm wrong, absolutely raise your voice and say, Roy, this is wrong. Here's why, et cetera. And we have these debates all the time because through debate, the best solutions come up. But that debate even happens because of choice. Uh, and I think true leadership is when the people around you, whether you're in a management role or not, you can be a leader because people want to follow you. And I think that's really, the, for me, the essence of leadership. That's beautifully said and, and so true. So how do you lead your teams through the, those uncertain times and in general? But like right now, how did you lead them over the past four months? Yeah, this has been a, a, a difficult, challenging, and exciting time all at once. As I mentioned, we had 
kind of these amazing milestones uh, as a company. We had the, the first flight of the world's largest all-electric commercial aircraft, uh, which is unbelievable. And we did that working on it and flying it at the time of COVID. And so that was unbelievable. And then on the exact opposite uh, of the spectrum of excitement on that, we unfortunately had to lay off people, quite a few people uh, from one of our offices or, or actually both of our offices. And then we had to go through that going from you know the highest of excitement to the unfortunately lowest of kind of positions where you're laying off team members who we consider family members because we don't have much choice because of what's happening in the aviation industry around us. So for me, the biggest aspect throughout this whole time has been transparency. As long as I and the rest of the leadership team and, the, and every employee is completely transparent with each other, why are things happening? What are What's happening? What are we doing to try and mitigate it? What are we trying to do to overcome it? As long as we're completely transparent and not giving kind of a corporate message or here's what politically correct is to say, but rather everyone, here's what's going on. Industry is collapsing around us. Airlines are shutting down. We no longer have the same budgets that we had six months ago. We have to stretch our budgets. And so unfortunately we have to let go people. Here's how we're making that decision. Here's how we're making the decision of who's being let go. And please know it's not any one of your faults because if there weren't COVID-19, we wouldn't be doing this. And at the same time, for those that stay and for those that leave, celebrating their amazing achievements of bringing these aircraft to the air, being able to develop these amazing propulsion systems. So to me, transparency is really what it's about uh, in at all times, but definitely in times like this. It is. It is. People, people respect you when you talk to them with and explain to them the reality, the factual reality of things. And... Uh, um, a, a lot of people at a senior level are, are scared of that truth and, and they find themselves uh, in between, you know, the pressure of boards and then investors and then a team. But you know, it might be dull what we're saying, but saying the truth and being transparent is, is it's always, you know, the best solution. So. One of your core values uh, is doing the right thing even when it's hard, and it's also the core value of Magni X. Um, can you share with me one time when doing the right thing has been incredibly difficult? Maybe mm. just oh. laying off people right now, but... Um, uh, uh, yeah, okay. I, I think I'll use that as the most recent okay. example because it is. And it's not just the fact that we had to let go of people. It's also how we did it. Uh, and from when you look at from a company perspective, given the budgets, given the situation in aerospace, given the ongoing delay of the recovery that's expected for aerospace, looking at the wealth, well-being of the entire company, we had to let go of people to do it. Now, it would have been a lot easier to kind of put our heads in the sand and say, oh, well, you know, uh, let's try and continue a little more. Maybe things will change. Let's stretch it. Let's take 10% salary off of everybody and give everyone one more week. Okay, well, or two more weeks. And then you find out that that wasn't enough because the significance of the downturn in aviation is so big that maybe we could cut people's salaries 50 or 60% and make up that difference. But then is that really a life for all employees? And are they happy to do that? Uh, and the answer is, and there's a lot of, of kind of anecdotal research around that is cutting everyone's salary, 5% is one thing if that helps. And maybe with a large scale company, 5% is a lot of money. But when you're 50 people, cutting 5% or 10% of salary doesn't make up, and it's a group of engineers, it doesn't make up a lot. And so you have to do the right thing that's very hard, which is what's the minimal number of people I can let go of that will allow the company to continue well into the future and be successful for those that remain, meaning those that unfortunately we had to, to say goodbye to, all of their work to date wasn't done for nothing and the company suddenly shut down. They get to see the fruits of their labor, if you will, in the continued success of the company. And that was very hard. That was a tough decision to come to, both personally as and as a company. But then being very transparent about it, not keeping it secret, not saying, oh, well, let's first decide how do we do it and then tell the employees. We, within uh, a two to three week period of making that tough decision, 
immediately let the, the employees know. Because we need to know, first of all, legally what we can do. We have operations in Australia and the US. How do you let people go? What's the process, et cetera? So we have to quickly make sure that we're not violating, one, any laws, and two, that we're doing it with full dignity. How do we give employees benefits even after they're laid off and so on so that they can continue during a tough time for them to at least know that health care is paid for, et cetera? So we quickly put that thing together and then immediately let the employees know. And a lot of their questions, we didn't know the answer to because it was more important for me and for our leadership team to let the employees know, everyone, this is happening. We don't have all the answers yet. We promise that we will, but this is going to happen. So we should be prepared and, and do what we need to do to, to, to work through it. And that to us is one of those examples of doing the right thing, even when it's very hard. It is. It's, it's a great example. And thank you for sharing it with our audience as, you know, we're all going through a learning curve. And I think that uh, learning from others' leaders' experience through these specific times is uh, it's always inspiring. So uh, we are going through a storm of changes. And uh, the ones that will survive are the ones that have that capacity to, to accept, change, adapt, and uh, be able to survive and thrive through those times. Um, so in your industry, in, in the aerospace um, industry, can, can you tell us a little bit about the changes that are happening and, and what do you predict? We know that um, our consumer's behavior, our way of living is gonna change and there are some changes that will not go back to what they were. And um, so, so please tell us about your industry. Yeah, so uh, you know it's an interest. It's a fascinating industry. Uh, one, it's an industry that defies the laws of physics, right? It defies gravity. We go into the air, uh, yeah. and we we over the last a hundred years have been able to go from flying only a few hundred yards to be able to go to places around the world that we never even knew of or dreamt of being. And now you buy a ticket, and suddenly you're at the other side of the planet. I think people will always want to do that, either travel see other parts of the world, see other parts of the country. People will want to get together. Uh, as human beings, we're a social uh, being, so we want to get together. So meetings like this are great, but wouldn't it be 10 times better if we could actually sit together over a cup of coffee and share stories and talk? And, and so I don't think that will go away. However, how we do that may change. So for example, today, if you look at the 2019 numbers, which is the, the full year of data that we have, over 50% of airline flights were less than 500 miles in range. So for the most part, people don't necessarily want to travel far. In fact, 70% of airline flights are less than 1,000 miles in range. So it's not that everyone flies uh, New York to London or New York to Seattle. Most people fly within a close geographic proximity. And that's a you 45-minute know, flight, a two-hour flight. Right now, or pre-COVID, we were used to having to, unfortunately, drive 45 minutes to an hour to a big airport, arrive there an hour ahead of time, stand in line with hundreds, sometimes thousands of other people at this main airport, get onto an airplane with 100, 150 other people, sit in the middle seat, only to fly 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, get off at another airport with hundreds and thousands of other people, and drive again 45 minutes to our destination. We were used to that. More importantly, we didn't have much choice. Unless you happen to be one of the 1% that get to fly on demand with a private aircraft, the rest of us fly on airlines. And the airlines tell us when, where, to where, and for how much. Electric aviation is going to allow lower cost of operations. COVID-19 is going to require a change in behavior. Now, when people think about a 45 minute flight, they may think again about going to the main airport at JFK or Chicago or Seattle. They may think, hey, you know what? There's an airport closer by to my home. In fact, the United States has 10,000 airports, but the airlines only use 600 of them. So people might start to think, hey, wait a minute, with a small electric plane, small meaning five, nine, 19 people, Maybe I can drive only 15 minutes to one of these 10,000 airports that are closer to my home. I can arrive there 15 minutes ahead of time because there's no TSA lines of hundreds of people. It's only 20 other people. I can wear my mask. 
and know that I can get on a small plane. There's no middle seat. I can wear my mask and there's only 10 people or 20 people around me. I still fly the same 45 minutes, but I arrive to another small airport that's only 15 minutes away from my destination. So I think people will start to demand the ability to fly short routes from small airports to small airports and small airplanes and not be stuffed with many others. Now, there's a lot of talk about, oh, you know, the air filtration system in the big airplanes is good and so on. But at the end, the experience is one that isn't very comfortable. And I think COVID-19 will accelerate the move to smaller airports, smaller airplanes, and electric aviation serves that. So we actually are very bullish about the future of aviation transport. It will just be very different from what we're used to today. It's, it, it is fascinating to hear about all that because I am a big consumer of traveling with airplanes. Uh, I've grown the first part of my company between Morocco, France, traveling to Middle East, coming to uh, the U.S. every month. And I, I for 10 years, I was in an airplane every every uh, week. And uh, then I moved to New York and settled more here and now COVID is there. And I feel that definitely the leisure travel is going to continue and actually people will want it even more than ever. The business travel will change. And and so where does Magni X plans to go in terms of um, the relationship, like the commercial relationship? Are, are you looking to be um, that too, like to, to develop it as an as an airline company and and having um, uh, commercial seats as you just described, or more having the the airplane and selling it as a private airplane or mix up both. Um, what are your plans there? Yeah, so so uh, we're going to stay a manufacturer. We're not going to operate uh, aircraft, electric or or any other, but we are going to provide the electric aircraft. Uh, in, in the ability to build and design electric aircraft uh, on various uh, models. Some will be a uh, consumer. Uh, it could be uh, sightseeing flights. It could be regular commuter flights. So think about uh, people not wanting to live in a crowded, expensive downtown anymore. And since now maybe we're getting used to working more from home, even if not permanently, maybe people will think about living in a more affordable, cleaner suburb that's maybe two hours drive away, but only 15 minutes flight away. Maybe electric aviation and small airplanes allow us to redefine what a suburb means. I could live 15 minutes flight away and fly into work twice a week because three days a week, I'll be working from home post COVID. And so the world is changing. And with that, the way we think about commuting could change, especially now again, because electric aviation will be so much cheaper and so much cleaner, zero emissions. Right? People are getting uh, upset with the fact that airplanes create emissions. Now there's going to be an alternative. And so that's kind of one side of the house. The other, the business aviation, as you, as you uh, described, people who travel for business, that's still going to be there. Visiting your factory, visiting your other offices, visiting customers. But as I mentioned before, maybe they won't want to fly in these large aircraft. Well, if aviation becomes significantly cheaper, 40 to 80% cheaper because electricity is so much cheaper and there's no maintenance on electric airplanes, maybe then companies can say, you know what, instead of flying in business class uh, on a domestic airline, maybe three of us can get together and charter a small electric airplane. And it won't be expensive like it is today. It won't create a lot of emissions like they do today. It'll be a nice, low cost, zero emission electric aircraft but you get the benefits of efficient and private flying. And so there's a lot of different alternatives that electric aviation will allow both leisure and business travelers to do that up until now has been impossible. So what would be the greatest innovation in your industry from your perspective? Like well, it, big. <laughs> yeah, it, it was creating motors that would be able to fly in airplanes. We've done that. The next would be being able to design really great airplanes uh, who can fly all electric. Our sister company, Eviation, has done that. The next big thing is going to be batteries. And really, it is the 
you know, chicken and the egg uh, uh, kind of analogy. Uh, if a year ago I went to a battery company and said, hey, why aren't there good batteries for an airplane? The response would be, and actually was, what electric airplane? There's no electric airplane. Why would I make a battery? Then you go to the airplane company and say, why aren't you building an electric airplane? And they would say, but there's no electric motor. And so you have to start with the electric motor. So we built that. Then the electric plane. Now the battery companies are making the investments to improve batteries. Exactly like cars, by the way. When Tesla started, the only car battery were the 12 volt uh, car batteries that you put next to the engine to power uh, the starter and other things. Now Tesla has become real. Other car companies are building electric cars as well. So now suddenly the batteries are improving and we're seeing where once electric cars could drive 40 or 50 miles, now they're driving 400 or 500 miles because batteries have improved. The same thing is going to happen with airplanes and that's the biggest uh, uh, innovation I'm looking at. Thank you, Rai. So Rai, we're gonna get a little personal and I would like you to tell me, you have two daughters and, and one son and uh, a wife that has been your, your partner in this long journey as uh, you were going from one amazing career experience to another. Um, what do you do to empower these women in your life? Wow. Uh, first of all, <laughs> first of all, I think I make sure that they know uh, that I'm last place in the house, uh, and and so I think I think that's one element. Uh, but but in all seriousness, uh, one of the things that we talk about transparency uh, at work, uh, I'm the same person at work as I am at home, uh, and that's very important. My people, my people at work know that, and my family knows that. There's not a home Roy and a Magni X Roy. There's just Roy. Uh, the whole notion of work-life balance, I, I don't think there is such a thing. First of all, work is part of life. There's just life balance. Uh, I bring my work home because I'm a human being and it's in my head. I bring my family to work because I'm a human being and it's in my head. You, there's no wall that you can suddenly separate and say, oh, I'm done. At least not in, in, the, in what I found uh, throughout my career uh, and none of the type of work that we do. So one of the things I try to do is be fully transparent at home. When am I having a good day at work? When am I having a bad day at work? Why am I having a bad day at work? Why am I having a good day at work? And so my kids, my daughters, my wife, my son, they get to understand as they grow up, what are the things that frustrate, in this case, a CEO uh, or previously, you know, a CEO, a, a director, what are the things that frustrate me and why? Then the second is, again, open debate. Uh, at home, the kids get to challenge everything. They don't always get what they want. There's a difference, right? It's not that the kids do whatever they want and get to do whatever they want, but they get to challenge status quo. Hey, why are we doing this? No, I don't think this is right. No, this is not okay, this decision. And we're entitled, if you will, all of us, to differ in our opinions and argue for our opinions. And I see with my daughters, especially, when they feel comfortable arguing a point, then I'm going to trust that when they leave the home, They'll also argue the point outside, because I would think it's pretty hard to argue with your father. Uh, but to argue with someone else who's an equivalent should be easier if you've been trained and empowered to do so. So for me, training them and, and allowing them and enabling them this continuous ability to debate and question and argue and fight for what's right, I, I want to believe will help them as they grow. And, and I've seen some examples of that. For example, my eldest daughter, when she was in high school, she was really into robotics and engineering, and she joined a robotics team. And out of a few hundred boys, there were only four girls. And so she eventually got on one of the all boys team, and she started to help them build robots and so on. But at some point, she came back and said, you know, Dad, I feel like something's wrong. They don't let me represent. They don't let me do some things and so on. And I don't know why. But very quickly, she found out why when the captain of the boys team texted her, uh, you know, hey, Neri, you're the only girl on the team and you're a distraction for the other boys. Please don't come back. Can you imagine that? Unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. And so I asked her, she came to me in tears, and said, what do I do? And, and I asked her, what do you want to do? I said, I want to be in a robotics team. Okay, so what do you want to do? As opposed to me telling her, I tried to get her to tell me, what, what do you want to do? She says, I want to build my own team. Great, go do it. So she left that club, went to the high school, and opened an all-girls 
robotics team. Unfortunately, the school didn't want to help her. And the school said, oh, you know, robotics is very different, difficult. Why don't you choose something easier? And I think to myself, that's how you discourage girls from going into STEM, by telling them it's too hard. So what did she do? She continued fighting and said, no, I want to build this team. Eventually, from another club, an all-boys team heard about this, called her and said, hey, why don't you bring your all-girls team to us? We'll do a co-ed team, and you get to be the captain of the co-ed team. And that's what they eventually did. And she had an amazing time and what an amazing experience to help her go learn about the challenges of what it means to be a woman in engineering. It's not right, but I think it's great that she gets to experience that and feel like she's empowered to actually fight back. Totally. No, it's amazing. Look, you, you, you're seeing, you're, you're witnessing the challenges and uh, unconscious bias that are going on out there. And if, and if you were not that type of father to push her back in the ring and tell her, well, you want it, just do it and empower her, then she would have just been discouraged, which is the case of, of many little girls that watched the wrong content that always puts them yeah. in a vulnerable position, in a romantic position. And so what made me who I am is that I, I was a tomboy as a child, grew up with an older brother. And another thing is I my dad has always raised me with a lot of logic. I mean, I come from a very conservative background. I was the only daughter of my father, but he he was intelligent. I always pushed my intelligence. And whenever I wanted to get something, I had I had that space to debate with him. And that's what grew my, my sense of logic and, and it helped me all my life. So so you are doing the right thing. So we're gonna finish with one question, which is our audience is, is mainly feminine and they're all talented women across different industries. Um, I, I want you to share with them what is, you know, is there space for recruitment in general uh, for women to join your company? And what would it take them um, to, to, to be able to commit to your industry? So, so first of all, absolutely, there is space. Not only is there space, there's a huge need. And even though there seems to be a lot of layoffs in aviation, and there are in aerospace today, there's also a lot of recruitment because Part of the layoffs are because we have the wrong people for the situation that we're in, but we may need other types of people to continue and grow. And so absolutely there's a demand. And I, I say to the women a few things. One, apply. Don't assume, oh, aerospace is masculine, so I probably won't get a job, so why even apply? No, apply. There are a lot of executives out there like me, a lot of companies like ourselves that want more women, want more diversity. But if you don't apply, I can't find you. And so apply. Even if you think there's a small chance, you never know, right? And so that's first of all. The second, there's also, I've heard many times, young women tell me and, and, and our uh, people in our company, I don't want to join a small startup because I probably won't get as good of a benefit as a big company when I'm pregnant or if I want maternity leave. And the answer is that's not true. Maybe 10 years ago that was true. But today, that's not the case. Startups and small companies provide tremendous benefits, and I find even more so than the big companies, because you're not a number. You're not one of 100,000 employees. You're one of 50. You're part of the family. And so the company will take care of you. So that's the second thing. And then the third, there's also I've heard from a lot of women, hey, you know, I want to start a family and so on. And so I would rather work for a big company that's safer and more secure. And I think we've proven as an industry that's not the case. Look at the percentages of people being laid off from companies in our industry, Boeing, Airbus, Rolls-Royce, GE, Pratt & Whitney, and small companies continue to grow. We're hiring. We just got a new facility, a bigger facility, because we're growing. And so from that perspective, don't let old company behavior and thinking make you think anything different. Apply for that job. Demand uh, rights, demand capabilities, demand the maternity leave if it's relevant, demand the privacy room if that's relevant, but don't think that anything shouldn't be right because you're making assumptions. If you don't try, there's one thing that's assured, you'll never get it. That That is very inspiring. Roy Gonzarski, thank you so much. 
um, for, for joining us today. It was such an inspiring interview. Uh, everyone, you were watching Be a Leader, our limited series featuring CEOs, trailblazers, and world leaders. Uh, our guest today was Roy Gansarski, the CEO of uh, MagniX. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today.